Edmund White and Doric Wilson are powerful writers, critics, even old friends. We brought them together to discuss their first-hand accounts of the Stonewall Riots and how bearing witness to the uprising impacted their work and views of the LGBT experience. You, you were active in the very beginning of gay theater. Technically, the first modern gay plays uh, were done at the Cafe Chino on Cornelia Street. Written by myself, Lanford Wilson, Robert Patrick. We never realized that what we were doing was brave. Of my four Chino plays, two are gay plays, in so, in so much that they were open gay characters. They don't discuss being gay. Uh -huh. That's not what the subject matter of the plays are. Which play is that? Uh, pretty People. There's an out character in it that has no, no stereotypes. He just happens to be a very attractive young man, and he's gay. I so mean, I, you might not have been surprised by it, but I think I was, that, I, that, I that think openly we, gay material is being Everybody used. was. We didn't think yeah. about it. How did you uh, uh, decide to write about gay subject matter? Actually, how did you? <laughs> well, for me, I'm sure it was a lot more tormented than for you. I mean, I think in my case, I... I had actually written a gay novel in the 60s, which was pretty good. And it went to 25 publishers and it was turned down, oftentimes by editors who themselves were gay, and who years later told me, you know, I really liked that book of yours, but I didn't dare accept it because people would have known I was gay. I don't know that gay liberation per se had any direct response to gay culture. Oh, I think it did. You did? I think it absolutely did because, for instance, there were organizations that. See, I moved to Rome in 1970, and by the time I came back a year later, I was shocked by how different everything was, so, because it was very dramatic for me. And when I and one of the things that was happening was the uh, Gay Academic Union, which would have these meetings where people Sorry, would say, "You're, you're right." People, I would, People's, I think of the movement, I think of the activist movements. Yeah, I but there were these yes. intellectual movements. Yeah. And I remember being invited by student organizations to Princeton, to different gay organizations, uh, student ones, that later died out. Gay liberation originally and first and foremost meant for us sexual liberation. It meant sexual opportunity because what a lot of people forget is that is that is that there were very, it was very hard for gay and lesbian people to meet each other. Yeah. I, I agree with you that it gave, gave sexual freedom, but I also think it gave identity. Absolutely. Through all, through education, uh, education and programs. And the identity was of a minority group rather than of a sickness. Yes. Oh yeah. After the World's Fair in '64 yeah. or so. The mayor was uh, always closing gay bars. He was closing them before, before the, world, the World's Fair. Because he wanted to clean the city up yeah. for the World's Fair. And the idea was that tourists would be appalled and disgusted if they saw any gay activity, little realizing that many people would come to New York for that. Maybe around 66 or 7, gay bars began to reopen, and then there were quite a few of them. And there were a lot, many more visible gay people on the street. Yes, and, and more people were coming out. Yeah. And I arrived in New York out. I've always been out. I came out in the 50s in a Wheat Ranch Town yeah. High School in yeah. Washington State. But it, but it was very rare. I know. Then, when all the bars began to reopen, everybody thought, oh, phew, that horrible period is over, and, uh, and now we're going to be free. And so when the Stonewall was raided and closed, I think it really upset people because it seemed like a throwback to a, well, also, a slightly uh, earlier in, era. In that era, when bars were raided, they were never raided on the weekend. They were always raided on a slow night because the police and the bar owners had agreements. It wasn't the police raid, no. it was the ATF yeah. who raided yes. because they had found out that the police were in collusion yeah. with the mafia owners. I mean, of course, what's famous about Stonewall is that the customers resisted instead well, the, of... The, the, what's, actually, what happened, all the customers got out on the sidewalk and the police were trapped inside not knowing there was no back exit out of this tunnel. I was there. Oh, I, I didn't know. Sorry. I was there. No, I was there because I just happened to be walking past. Me too. I wasn't actually in the bar, nor did I go to that bar no, very no, often. No. But I was walking past with a friend and, of course, we were intrigued and we stayed there. And I was so awful and middle class that I kept trying to get everybody to calm down. Oh, come on, guys. You know. <laughs> and, but even in spite of myself, in spite of my awful bourgeois self-hatred, I uh, found myself excited. People weren't angry. First of all, there was astonishment that we were doing it. And, and when we would say things like, uh, slogans like, gay is good, uh, patterned after black is beautiful, yeah. 
it struck us as hilarious. Yes, there was a gr great gleefulness about it. But there was also a feeling that it was preposterous because, after all, it was really at Stonewall, I think, that people, like gay people, first realized that they might be something like a minority group yes. rather than a medical diagnosis. Because up till then, we were sick. Yeah. And there was always some point in the evening where we'd all say, oh, God, we're sick. And then... Oh, get, some. Yeah, right, right. And then, but, I but, never had a problem with it. Well, you probably didn't, but everybody else Every, did. Well, not everybody else did. It's no. kind of the world you lived in. Yeah. Most of the people I knew didn't. I was in therapy for years and years trying to go straight. And all, <laughs> I was engaged twice. You know, the yeah. typical middle class person suffering over the whole thing. And then the, the wonderful thing about Stonewall for jerks like me was that it, it was liberating. Yes. The gay world was in the dark. The term, one of the terms for it at the time was the twilight world. A twilight gaze came out from under their rocks or whatever. Sure. And with Stonewall, we started coming out in the daylight. Not twilight people anymore. Yeah, not twilight people anymore. Yeah. John Irving wrote you an open letter. And I think he mentions in it that the gay marriage phenomena going on at the moment uh, revitalizes the movement. Yes, I mean, John Irving lives in Vermont. He's a straight man, of course, the great writer of the world, according to Garp, and so many other wonderful books. And he was very active in campaigning for it in Vermont. And it does look as if that is the current big issue. I mean, for people like me who who never liked marriage and, and also didn't like the idea that gay people should be assimilated to the to the mainstream <laughs> community, that's now a lost cause, and, and, and I've given up on it. And what I now see is is that 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 the marriage issue goes right to where people live. I mean, it, it's all right to say yes, you gay people can have job security, and yes, you gay people can produce your musicals, or whatever. But when you want to get married, it it feels like one of the central institutions of our society, and especially when you want to adopt children or have children of your own. It's funny we don't change you and I. Bottom line, I don't <laughs> think we do. No. I guess not. Well, we're uh, we're still here, and yeah. uh, and and it, it's it's really been great to uh, see you again. Yes, indeed.